This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, uh, Yipin, for the introduction. Um, so again, there is the title of the presentation. I'm very um, honored to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation and for you to be um, here sitting today to hear what I have to tell you. Um, I think Yipin already covered this part. So um, I have my background in forestry breathing. Um, I worked there for a few years on that. And then I was the PI for forage breathing, for the forage breathing program at the University of Florida for a few years. And then nowadays I'm working in blueberry breeding. When I was working in forages, I started the, um, basically the research of polyploid species because I was working mainly with alfalfa as a research model in that uh, moment. And then when I started working with blueberries, you know, it translated very nicely because both the species are out of tetraploid. So I'll be telling you a little bit about that today. But today in the main, you know, um, species that uh, we're going to be uh, referring to or talking to uh, and the one that I'm, I'm using as a model is uh, high bush blueberry, right? And this is vaccinium corymbos. So during the talk, I, I hope to convince you that this is a good species, that it's an important species, and then actually you should be eating blueberries. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you know, I'm going to tell you how the breeding happens in the research that we are carrying about uh, carrying on to actually make it faster, better, and more accurate, right? So first, let me tell you that the blueberry production and consumption is increasing rapidly. Nowadays, I mean, the US has always been the number one consumer of blueberries globally. Um, and nowadays, actually, this is outdated already, but nowadays the per capita consumptions of blueberries here in the US is uh, 2.75 pounds uh, per person. Right, and then the production keeps increasing as the industry has created a year round um, availability of blueberries in the supermarket, which I'm sure that you guys have seen, um, there is more consumption and that creates you know, more production and then it goes on and on. This is all you know, um, boosted or um, kind of with the label of blueberries are good for you, right? Get a boost of blue, you know, it healthy, it blue, right? Um, so it's a pretty important species for us. You know, it's a very big industry globally nowadays. <clears throat> now for the breeders, and I think this is very important, uh, if you are a breeder, uh, this is the things that probably you wanna know right away. So we have a perfect flower, easy hand pollination, an advantage, those are the good things, right? Relative short cross to fruit time. So I'm gonna, um, Demitify that very uh, shortly, you know, even when it's a perennial fruit species, uh, the varietal type that we breed, we can get fruit in one year, a difference of other um, uh, fruit species or, or the uh, blueberry that's grown here in the north. And I'm gonna go there in a second. Many seeds or progeny per cross, that's a pretty nice, right? An advantage. Um, we can clonally propagate it, very nice, and we use then uh, cuttings to propagate, and at the same time we use um, tissue culture, of course. Now the bad things in breeding depression, that's a bad things for us. Uh, it's highly heterozygous, which is good. And in reality, you know, I don't believe that we understand very well the still that level of heterozygosity that exists in polyploid species and how that affects um, very well the expression. But I'll, I'll go there uh, in a second later. And it's an autodotraploid autopolyploid specifically, and that creates some uh, challenges that I'll be discussing as well. Blueberry is only one of the very few species that actually was domesticated here in the US. Very, very few. I think there is only like three to four species that now are consumed globally that actually was domesticated here in the US. And this happened just in 1910, around 1910. I, I don't wanna be, uh, exact with the date and then uh, it's not exactly the date. But if around 1910, the great breakthrough happens, and I was talking with Jipin early uh, about this, when the researchers discovered that actually it was acid soil that was needed in reality to, to, to grow the plant. 
you know, to manage it. Otherwise, you know, you could not get a vigorous plant and you could not get enough blueberries. So all the plants that they were transplanting from the wild actually were dying because the soils were not acid enough. And that was the breakthrough moment. It's amazing how something, you know, so um, insignificant if you think about all the technology, everything that we do, it has, it can have such a big impact, actually, that that was the point of domestication that happened. It happened so a few years ago in terms of domestication that we have the whole track of the history of the domestication, as I'm telling you right now. And even we have all the pedigrees associated with the domestication. Nowadays, we spend like five years of, uh, carrying the um, um, discovery or discovering the, the pedigree of, of the whole crop. And now we have around, you know, 16,000 lines of pedigree in, our pedigree in our breeding program. Now, this species that was domesticated here, it couldn't be grown in the South, right? Because it has high chill requirements. So anybody that works with fruits, uh, it will understand uh, that concept, right? So uh, researchers in the 1950s start the efforts to cross in this uh, Northern high bush that we call it, right? With native species of the South, to create the hybrid that uh, nowadays we know as the southern high bush. So still this southern high bush is a vaccinium corymbosum, so uh, botanically, but in reality, genetically or genomically, I call it is a potpourri of genomes, right? It has not just uh, this vaccinium darrow y um, in the genome, but in reality it has other five or six species that have been used through the history of the breeding from the 50s up to today. So it's a potpourri of genomes in reality, okay? But that's the main species that uh, I'm referring to today and then I'll be discussing about. These two species, I mean, that's the first question that you're probably gonna be thinking about, how different are, are they, right? So the Northerns from the Southerns. So this is a PCA, very simple PCA using around 29 different quality, fruit quality traits. And then uh, just to show you that, you know, even when one is derived from the other, they are very different in, uh, in the way that they, they, they express their traits. So here we have in blue, the Northern high bush, and this is a population of around 1000 individuals from Oregon. And then we have uh, from Oregon breeding program, and then we have the Southern high bush in red, which is the breeding population around 1,000 individuals from our program as well. So that's uh, very interesting for us. And this is very fresh. This is using phenotypic data, but uh, we are genotyping all these populations as part of one of the CAP projects that we have. So with the domestication or the adaptation of this new varietal type to the South, um, now there was the expansion you know, of, of grow and production in the South. But not just that, in reality, that helped significantly to the expansion, to the global expansion as well of um, blueberries in tropical and subtropical areas. And nowadays, um, from our breeding program, at least we license to 14 or 17 different countries um, in every single year, as, I, as I'm gonna be showing you. And we work with many different uh, companies and producers around the globe. Um, the program has developed many cultivars since the origin of the program or since the beginning, right? And this is just to show you that um, is, this is not just history, this is a very active breeding program. And then almost every year we have the capacity to release one to two cultivars because we have a very established pipeline. And given that we work globally with different producers, there is always need for one of our cultivars somewhere. Um, and just to show you, you know, more or less how they look, this is one that actually I just uh, released uh, this year. Now, what is the impact that plant breeding has had in, in the species? And this is just, again, to, you know, prove you somehow to that plant breeding can have a big impact in the domestication and in the uh, improvement of, of blueberries as a crop. So here we have the firmness of the fruit in the Y axis. and the X axis, we have the year of release of the cultivar. So each of these dots here is one cultivar. So we did track all the cultivars and every piece of information that exists about the firmness of the fruit. And obviously through the history has been 
um, quantify in different ways, we try to standardize as much as we could, right? And then we see in red, the Northern high bush, the originally domesticated. And then we see in blue, the Southern high bush, the ones that we work with. And as you see, there is a huge increase and it's starting around the 1970s, uh, 19, between 70s and 80s, a huge increase in the um, firmness of the fruit product of the uh, breeding efforts that they were happening in different places, right? Now we see a larger increase or a more steep increase in the case of the Southern high bush. And that will be probably easy to understand after what I'm gonna tell you. So in the case of Southern high bush, they are replaced faster by the producers because they don't survive as long as they do the Northern high bush here in the Northern part of the country, right? Just this summer, I was in Michigan in a planting that was established 70 years ago, right? And actually the blueberry variety that they were used, it was one of the original ones that comes from here. The ones that actually was extracted directly from the wild. So it was kind of a domesticated uh, plant that they still were using to produce blueberries, right? So if that happened, you as a breeder, what is the incentive to release new cultivars if they don't get adopted, right? Now, because the Southern ones, they last a lot, long, a lot less, right? Around 10 to 15 years, there is always need to be replacing them, right? So whenever the grower makes a decision to replace them, obviously it's gonna choose whatever is best and whatever is available, right? So that's the main difference, I would say. Now that the breeding program is probably, I would say almost, almost the way I wanted to run it, right? Um, we do have four stages or five stages if you consider the cultivar uh, uh, release part, right? As the product development, and we go through different stages from all the way whenever we do the crossings and we germinate around maybe 200,000 seedlings, um, all the way to 20 plants establishing multi-state trials, um, and then also in, in different states, in uh, to release one of, or two cultivars per year. This process has been carried out for the last 30, 35 years without stopping. Every single year this happens. So whenever I come into this program and what you see here, there is a lot of changes, little changes in the logistic, you know. Uh, most probably students are gonna think that the biggest things that you can do in a breeding program is just put technology and make a huge change a huge increase in the productivity, in the accuracy, in the speed. But in reality, I will argue that a lot of what you need to do is to improve the logistic of a program and everything else is gonna be helping to make it better. Um, so in this process nowadays, we use um, molecular markers. Of course, we use genomic selection as well in an operational way for the last four years. Um, and then we also use some metabolomics um, to decide what it needs to be released for the consumer. We are fortunate that we have a huge diversity, and this is what I call the blue universe, right? Uh, and then the truth is that we're still exploring this because I don't know if you have ever seen, you know, this very beautiful uh, plot of the pedigree of Pioneer in the past and now the Cortiva, right? where you have the different heterotic groups, uh, beautiful, right? And then they know very well, you know, what you need to cross to exploit that uh, heterosity. Uh, hopefully one day we can, we can get there, right? It will take them some time to untangle this mess, I will say, but for now we are good. We have good diversity to keep moving forward. Now, Let's talk a little bit about the research and how, what are the tools and what are the things that we use to, to do research, right? So mainly as trained genomicists and quantity geneticists, I uh, will say that the main things that we do, and then I'm excluding here uh, RNA-seq and all the other things that potentially we could be using, are these uh, three different things here. So, you know, QTL analysis, very, structured populations, right? That you create, you create the recombination, 
But in the other end, you have genetic, genetic association or GWAS analysis, hopefully with a very um, high resolution if you do have the number of individuals and the number of markers to cover that genome, right? And I will say that in the middle, you know, is it something that um, is very practical for us because genomic wise selection or genomic selection or genomic prediction, whatever you guys wanna call it, right? It's a methodology that was proposed to be, to be used in populations, semi-structured populations, I will say, right? There is benefit to using QT in, in populations as a structure as a QTL or biparental populations. Uh, I will argue that, yes. Uh, and then probably you cannot use it in, in diversity panels because you don't have the structure that you need to track what you need to track there, okay? And we can argue about that and we can discuss. At the end of the day, all this depends on linkage. Linkage disequilibrium or the size of the linkage block is gonna tell you what tool you should be using and how do you move forward with that strategy? You know, so if I know in this very well, you can decide what can you move operationally and what, what the studies do you need actually to uh, find markers uh, to be used in the breeding program. Now, the biggest challenge, and this is gonna be very surprising if any of you uh, does any quantity genetics or have estimated any heritabilities or anything like that, the biggest challenge for us actually when I start working in polyploid species is that you could not even build the A matrix, what is called the numerator, numerator uh, matrix, numerator relationship matrix, or the um, um, relationship matrix, kinship matrix in reality. You know, it's twice the kinship matrix it gives you the relationship matrix, right? It was not possible to do. So one of the first things that we did back in 2015, we started working on this, is actually to develop a free package so everybody could do it, not use us. So that's the first thing, obviously we did it for our needs, but then we realized it was needed to be used for everybody because there was nothing like that in that moment. Actually, there was one single software that cost like, I think it was $15,000 per year. And it came from Australia. So I, I'm not gonna say there was nothing. There was a software. You just need to pay a lot of money to use it. Um, so we built a free one, right? Um, nowadays, this software handles any ploidy, pedigree, genomics, or both included, additive dominance and epistasis. There is 13 different methodologies in, in there. So you choose what do you wanna use depending on what do you want. And also it handles, you know, continuous genotyping, which is gonna be something I'm gonna be discussing in a second. Ploidy is an issue at that moment, imagine, I mean, we were starting this work and there was no even way to build the, re the relationship matrix to calculate, to estimate heritabilities and then to predict breeding values, which is my training. So I, that's the first thing I wanna do in a breeding program, predict breeding values to see what I need to cross and how do I need to move the program forward. So we couldn't even use it, right? So ploidy is an issue, was an issue. And then, um, you know, you have here the, the, in a graphical way, how you can represent this, right? So you have counts of one allele or counts of the second allele, the alternative allele. And then each of these dots represent one individual. Right. So, and eventually, here is a pretty, uh, pretty plot that says, you know, how many doses of you have from each of these individuals' alleles, right? Um, and then you can fit these nice models. There is like six or seven different models that actually we fit uh, to find out in a GWAS or in a genomic selection as well. You can fit them in whatever. I mean, if you, if you know what you are doing, you can fit it in whatever way you want it, right? But actually, whenever you are fitting these different models, obviously you're asking a different question, right? So it depends on the hypothesis that you, are, you have behind. Now, the issue is that this is very messy. It's never as pretty as this, right? And then um, one of the things that we worked on, I don't think I put that here, nope. Uh, for the operational use, again, I was trained in this area. We needed to use markers to optimize a lot of the things that we need to optimize. So basically the way that we went, okay, we use this software that we have developed. We could call the dosage or deploy the, as I was mentioning before, but then we did some studies and work actually to demonstrate that we can use continuous genotyping. Basically the ratio of one allele to the other 
in order to use in the prediction models. And that was you know, published in this paper uh, sometime in 2019. Um, so with that, it solved one of the issues. I mean, by that time, there is many softwares that you could use to call ploidy, but in reality, none of them were, were very accurate. And even nowadays, I will argue that it still is a mess because of um, it's, not very, it's not very clean, the, the, the calling of the, of the ploidy. So then we impute that dosage of ratio in, in some of the softwares, and then we evaluate different things for the practical use of the molecular markers in the breeding program. Again, and nowadays, you know, we use that operationally. And then we went obviously through a phase of the optimization of these molecular markers and populations because, again, genomic selection works. Genomic prediction works. I mean, it's not a matter of if it works or not, you know. And, um, and I always like to discuss this with the students, you know. It's not a matter of you are going to test it to see if it works. It works. Why you need to optimize is the population that you are using and how to integrate that in the breeding program, right? Um, so we went through a whole uh, phase of optimization of that, uh, of all populations and our molecular markers and the way that we did it in order to have a way to apply it uh, operationally. And nowadays, actually, in this very moment, we are going through a second phase of optimization to try to make it even better, cheaper, and faster. So with that way, we could decrease, you know, the traditional pipeline of around 12 to 15 years, actually, to, to develop uh, uh, cultivars to, um, you know, roughly half. In reality, seven to eight years, we can release a cultivar now. They, a lot of logistic improve, not just genomic selection. Now, now we have the capacity to get breeding values. So what do you do with them? And then I, I will argue the second and very, very important phase is actually to know whether you need to be crossing, right? So in this stage, a few years ago, we start to uh, creating optimization, but in reality, you know, there is a very nice uh, software that was released by our friends in Edinburgh. Um, and then in our case, we do 100 crosses. So this is the argument, 100 crosses every year, right? And we, used, we try to use every single plant alive to see what it needs to be crossed in, for the next generation, right? Uh, so roughly, we use only one of the stage two. We have four stage two, three stage twos at every single time. So we have around 8,000 plants in a stage two every single year. But let's say that we use the newest one only. So plus all the other individuals from stage threes, four cultivars, and some of the wild species back crosses that we have. Um, there is about 4 million possible crosses that we can carry, right? Because we do 100, so there's virtually infinite number of 100 groups that you can get out of these 4,000 million, uh, 4 million uh, possible crosses, right? So graphically, I'm very graphic to see what we need to do, right? So we have one single trait. This is firmness of the fruit. We have the diversity of the population given by the relationship matrix across all these individuals that we have in the population. So then you have this cloud. So each of these dots is a potential cross that you can make, right? Um, and this is the breathing, the plant breather, you know, problem, you know, how to maximize gain without compromising diversity in your breathing program. And you wanna be there, right? So this is an optimization problem, right? And being an optimization problem, the solution is always going to be in the border, right? So the thing is, how do you navigate to get there, right? And then again, our friends in, um, you know, in Edinburgh were able to release this this software, AlphaMate, that basically, you know, explored the um, the statistical space, basically the vectorial space, to get to the optimum and then to decide which crosses you need to make. Nowadays, we have optimized, I mean, a customized or own optimizer because this was made originally for cattle, of course, for animals uh, where uh, they are been doing this a lot um, longer than uh, we are. So we have different restrictions in the optimization problem that we need to, um, we need to input, impute in the, in, the, in the equation in reality. And that's why we have to create our own. And there is a still a lot of work to do in this in reality. But this is just uh, to give you an idea. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about in that time, again, we are talking about whenever, you know, this ploidy was not very uh, resolved yet, a few, you know, five, five, six, seven years ago. People was fitting still diploid models into the tetraploid data, right? So then we asked the question, okay, can you do that without compromising the results? So then we, whatever tools that we have in those days, we fit, we did uh, tetraploid calling in our genomic data and then deploy calling, and then we did this comparison and find out as it makes sense, of course, because it's nature, right? If you fit tetraploid models, they work better, right? Again, in that time, you know, again, this happens a few years ago. It was not that logic or that, I mean, it, it was logic, but there was a lot of challenges to call deployed, right? Now, what am I going here? Because I mean, I went from prediction and apply and operational use of genomic data into try to find some function here, right? And some markers that actually we can also use in the breeding program. And the idea behind here is because there is already been a lot of information that uh, prior to this work, of course, um, um, for, for a long time already, that the use of biological information in our genomic selection or genomic prediction models will help the model to achieve higher accuracy, right? So at that moment, you realize, okay, then we need to find out what biological information can fit in our model. So this is just an example that uh, we have different populations here and we fit different models to, and we achieve different levels of accuracy, right? So yes, it helps. Now, another of the big, very big things, I mean, I'm being very fortunate that I'm in the time point when actually a lot of resources are being created. So we get to test them and then evaluate, you know, the capacity that these resources have to improve the work that we are doing. This is a very simple paper. I mean, if you're a student in breathing, I would just recommend you to read it. It's two, three pages, right? But it tells you exactly what is here, how a quality genome can improve what we do as breeders, right? And then it talks about very briefly about how genomic selection can be improved, how optimization of the markers can be improved. Um, and then in this case for the GWAS analysis, before without a genome, there is no way to order this, of course, you know. So what do you get out of here? What is your inference? That the trait is quantitative and it's everywhere, right? There is signal everywhere. And obviously after the genome, you know, it's like a beautiful, this is the same trait before and after uh, when we were doing this. Um, when I start working and we didn't have a genome, and again, it's, it's, it's not very long genome. It's not very big genome, it's even 600 megabase more or less. Um, and I came from pine trees, remember I told you before? Pine trees is a monster of a genome and still they are not able to assemble it. And then we have done many studies in the past with pine trees and we found this many times. It's like, okay, everything is quantitative, right? There is no way, and nowadays still they don't have a way to get to this point. So it's very relevant. So I will say, I will argue that if you are in the point that you can influence if a genome, if you're in, in your species of work, you don't have a genome yet, it's worth to, to do it. I know many of you probably are working on species that are not considered orphan as this one. Nowadays, not anymore. Um, so maybe you are way past this, this period. So we do a lot of GWAS analysis uh, in our program. And then, um, or research associate Felipe Ferrao, he has a GitHub where he has all the information of how we do it and everything. So if you wanna explore that, uh, you are welcome to, to, to do that. But just to give you an idea, because again, remember that we do a lot of genomic selection operationally, but at the same time, uh, we have a lot of students that are carrying different projects for different questions, and then we get to accumulate a lot of data. So it's been very nice for us to discover or to ask many questions. And this is all the different traits that we're exploring and the class, and then how many data points. So for the main traits that are being used for uh, breeding uh, blueberries, we have around 7,000 data points that we use. And nowadays we have pretty good idea of where the signals coming from the genome for each of them. Um, 
And at the same time, because we do a lot of GWAS, we have explored a lot of different ways to do it, right? So um, I'm gonna be showing you a few of the unpublished, we are in the process of, of, of working these things out and to validate some of them, of different methodologies and strategies that we are trying to use actually to improve the finding that signal that sometimes is, is, is hidden there, right? So for example, uh, multilocus Bayesian uh, instead of the traditional Q plus K methodology, right? What is this? It's basically just something like genomic selection for the ones that know, right? So it's just a, a mixed model with a model selection in, inserted in it. So then uh, you fit all the markers simultaneously and try to find the signal. And it makes a lot of sense that there is a lot of shrinkage in the markers. And then hopefully the ones that are here are just the ones that carry probably most of the signal. Now, in the past, I started working in genomic selection in 2011, 12, more or less. We tried this many times again, but it was the pine genome. So <laughs> we could not find, we could not resolve that uh, as we can do it today, given that we have much cleaner data and then we ask some of those questions. So it's very nice. We are in the process of exploring if this, for true, these values here carry the larger uh, signal or not, and then we can use them for uh, the breeding program. Another one that probably some of you have heard about it. I mean, this is not uh, new neither. So these are just different methods that we are exploring. Um, again, we have the Q plus K methodology here, traditional methodology of a structure plus polygenic effect uh, in a millennial mixed model. And then we have the local uh, methodology where the local methodology, basically what it does is that it doesn't use the molecular markers in the chromosome that you are um, questioning. Um, to build the polygenic effect or the relationship matrix, right? So in that way, they get excluded of that. And then again, we are able to find signal where there was nothing before, right? Now, is it true? Again, are in the process of validating all this. One of the issues with the local methodologies that create some bias, and then the, you will look at the QQ plots and you will be like, ah, eh, there's something wrong here, right? Um, but if the signal is true, we don't care how the QQ plots look, right? So from the operational point of view. Another one that is a very interesting um, for us is actually modify the phenotype that you are using. And this will make a lot of sense after I tell you that in reality, what we call firmness, I mean, we decide what is firmness, right? It's a trait that we arbitrarily they decide that that's firmness of the trait of the of the fruit, right? But does it really matter if it's, for example, in the fruit firm or the a firmness tech or whatever methodology you are using or a, or a box law, if it's 70 or 50, why does it matter, right? Well, what we are trying to do here is to find out what it matters for the consumer. Right? What is that point where the consumer, it makes a difference in the mouth of the consumers? Below that, it doesn't matter, you know, because all is the same. The consumer don't, doesn't like it. Above that, the consumer likes it. So then basically, you know, you can just feed a threshold model to find out what is that point of inflection. And in that point, you modify your phenotype. And then you ask the question, okay, is there any marker associated with this point of inflection? You get more power because at the end of the day, you know, these, these methodologies, they are kind of setting an experiment. The more repetitions you have, the more power you're gonna have, right? So in this case, you know, you increase the number of, uh, uh, decrease the number of treatments, uh, all the other, all the genotypes, they have to fall into these uh, two treatments only, right? below or under. And then fortunately, it gives us better signal, more power and very strong signals. Now, again, we're in the process of validating. I'm sorry that I don't have more progress for you at this point on this. So using all this information, um, we are being able to find out where the signal comes from for different traits, for example, fruit quality, 
or uh, volatiles, uh, they are very important for, for us. And I'll be talking to you guys, if I do have time, about them in a second. Um, and then some others that as part of uh, this CAP project that I was mentioning before also are gonna be uh, published very soon. Now, as I mentioned before, consumer for us is the most important variable, if you wanna call it, in the breeding process, right? Because at the end of the day, if the consumer eats more fruit, you know, the producer needs to produce more, more fruit, the nursery needs to produce more plants, and we need to produce more cultivars. So everybody's happy, right? So that's kind of the mentality. And this is just as part of this CAP project, you know, an experiment that we carry uh, last year and that we finished actually uh, this year also, the willingness to pay uh, related to overall liking you know, or the consumer experience in these panels. And then we see that these are, each of these dots is a different cultivar. And we see that, you know, cultivars where the consumer has a better experience is willing to pay more money, right? Makes sense. Um, the issue is that flavor or consumer experience is a very complex trait, very, very complex, right? Um, and um, I'm gonna be, just defining flavor very in a very simple way, you know, taste, whatever your tongue is able to uh, differentiate or sense, right? Which is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, right? And then whatever your receptors, you know, in the bottom of your brain um, are able to sense as well. And these are the volatile components. These are the same sensors that you use for orthonasal smelling, right? So when you grab a strawberry, that's easy. Everybody has a smell of strawberry, right? And you smell it. Those are the same sensors that you're gonna be using. The ones that I'm gonna be re referring here is the one whenever your mouth chew the food or fruit, it's in every food, right? It's not specifically for blueberries. In every fruit and food, these volatiles go from the back of your mouth and then go to the same sensors, right? So simple defined. That's where the way we're gonna define flavor. So taste plus. Now, the issue that is very complex, is very, very complex. An example that I use all the time is I said, I want you to think in this moment about the, you know, the dish that your mom or your grandma prepares. And then in that moment, you start salivating if you really get into thinking about that, right? And then it's an amazing dish, right? I can prepare the same dish and it could be even better by, you know, by external people. And then I give it to you and you're gonna say, no, my mom's or my grandma is better, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's because there is a lot into psychology, into the flavor component, right? Um, not just that, so the experience, the culture and everything related. So very, very complex. In the case of blueberries, we um, were able to identify a lot of these volatile organic compounds uh, with many studies. And actually we have done a lot more recently. And then we know more or less uh, what label to assign to each of them, depending on what uh, the compound is uh, giving you regarding the experience, right? So we know they are very important. And then uh, we have argued that the aroma probably or, the, is, or these volatile organic compounds are one of the best candidates for uh, marker assistant selection. They have simple genetic architecture, uh, they have large heritability, and they usually explain large variants. Um, and two of them, for example, very important for us for blueberries are linalol, that's a consumer enhancer. We have the program, not just myself, the program has done research since 2012 on this. So we have a large data set of consumer panel linked to biochemistry, volatiles, and at the same time with um, genomic data nowadays. And then eucalyptol, for example, while it might be very good in other products, uh, it's not good in blueberries, you know, people is a deterrent of, uh, of liking. So we have used also some RNA seq to validate some of these signals. So it's the first step. So what do you do after you find some signal? You need to validate it. So validate it operational. And this is what I was showing here in reality. So an operational or in silico validation by using different populations and then finding out that this trait is able to be predicted using these molecular markers. But also, I mean, we are in research, we are in a public institution, a part, as part of what we do, we are trying to find also what is the mechanism, right? Because if we find the causal gene, it will be a lot better for using in our prediction models. So we are able to validate some of these candidate genes, but very important. And then there is Vincent, 
Um, this guy here is the main author of this paper. Um, when he was in Florida, we worked together for a few years on this, uh, probably longer than we wanted, but uh, at the end of the day it came true. And the idea is that can we use all this volatile information, metabolite information also to assess the consumer pattern. And using again, this uh, large historical data, we're able to find out that first, the volatile organic components are more important than the traditional traits that are being improved for 100 years, which is sugars and acid in the consumer acceptance or consumer lower liking in tomatoes and blueberries. Um, and then those are the ones that we wanna use. Very, very briefly, and I'm finishing here. These are the sugars and acid here. One of the cool things that we found out that actually they were not very related to all the other volatiles. So while we can improve volatiles, we can improve sugars and acids simultaneously without having to um, compete or having a negative correlation, which is very important for us. Um, and at the same time, you know, some of these volatiles give you some sensation of aroma. Not every volatile, even they, they get captured through your olfactory system or sensors in the bottom of your brain, no each of them is gonna give you actually a sensation of aroma, right? So they are just might be consume, uh, uh, sugar enhancers or deterrents of liking, but they don't give you a, an aroma per se, right? An expression, if you wanna call it like that. So we're being able to pinpoint and actually there's some terpenoids in the case of blueberries are the responsible for some of the aromas that we like and we are after in the breeding process. So with that, I sorry, I got you longer than probably uh, you were intended to be sitting there, but um, I'll, I would like to acknowledge my lab um, because of all the work that we do is actually uh, because of them. And then with that, I'll be happy to take any question if we still have time and thank you. Yes. Uh, could you clarify it is the, uh, the firmness trait uh, of primary importance because of and is it uh, sensitive to stage of ripening and difficult therefore to get a good measure? Yes and yes. Um, that's the short answer. Now let me give you the long answer. So the uh, firmness is important in the whole process. So it's important because um, whenever you pick, you know, for storing that blueberry, for transporting that blueberry, you need it to be firm. And then for the shell life into the store. And also afterwards, when you're eating that blueberry, you want it still to be firm. You know, you don't want it to be smushy or soft, right? So that's already been, we already have found out that it's a very important characteristic. Actually, it didn't talk much about texture and firmness, but that's the other huge characteristic for us. And yes, it's influenced by maturity. And then nowadays up to day, you know, most of the research has been carrying out with blueberries that at the maturity stage, but there is a lot more to do in that area. Yes. How strong is the processing market for blueberries and what's the major breeding goal for fresh market versus processing market? Uh, we don't do blueberries for process in our case. Um, I think probably 90 or 95% of the industry in Florida is, or Southern High Bush is for fresh blueberries. And even I didn't mention even using machine harvesting techniques nowadays. So firmness is important for that too. The highest firmness is the most important trait for machine harvest for fresh. Um, there is a big industry for process, but it doesn't pay. So what you find in process is either blueberries that are discarded or uh, the wild blueberries from uh, the northern part of the country and Canada, British Columbia, which is low bush, is another species, it's this high more or less, it's called a vaccinium angustifolium. And then if you look in videos or in the internet, you're gonna see people raking them from the floor. Um, those, most of those go for uh, process because they don't have firmness. Yes. Have you had any luck predicting consumer preferences from the metabolite profile? That's a good question. Um, right, Vincent? <laughs> so we can grab the genomic data to predict very well the volatiles. Um, you know, this is the problem of A to B and B to C, but 
actually uh, this gap in the middle is not very easy to solve. Consumer liking is such a messy data, incredible messy data. Uh, and it's mainly because I was just mentioning it's so psychologically driven. Uh, every single person in this room are gonna like a, probably a different blueberries if I give you a bunch of blueberries. Um, and there is gonna be some tendencies. So nowadays what we do is that we breed for the average, right? But eventually, hopefully we can breed for uh, the segmentation of the population. And we do have data that is incredibly messy. So we have put 10 years of data to get some signal out and it still is messy, uh, what uh, most of the work that we do. So we are working with the sensory people in the university to create you know, more trained panels to give us better data. But at the same time, from a breathing point of view, it's like, you don't want them to be too trained, right? Because you wanna breathe for the population. So then there is this dichotomy of what do you do? If you go too much in that direction, you have the expert giving you an opinion, is that the same opinion of the general public? That's the issue. So it's, it's difficult. We have some things, but it's, it's difficult. Okay, so we have a uh, question from uh, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lee, for the question. Um, yes, I, on my way here, I was just talking to, uh, we have a extension specialist in our group. Uh, I was assessing everything in the South. And we do have one of our breeding sites affected. Uh, fortunately, we have 50 to 60% of the foliation only. So we're seeing how we're gonna be assessing that, uh, addressing that to make the plants live again because these are producing evergreen production system. So it's an issue because we need those leaves to stay on until you know May next year, more or less. Um, thank you. We are very good otherwise. Yeah, I have a question about uh, the acid soil uh, and so like a tea and also the other alumna accumulator, blueberry loves uh, acid soil. And so we know acid soil so aluminum is a big factor. I wonder, I mean, if the alumina has any contribution for like uh, stimuli, uh, the secondary uh, metabolized production or what uh, has any relation? So blueberry, is, blueberry needs acid soil, right? So that's the first thing to be vigorous and then to produce good fruit and good flavor. Um, through the breeding process and in the program, you know, I haven't been long enough to address more advanced questions, Yipin, uh, but I think that's probably the next, the next step. We have been trying to address all the basic, if you want to try to implement tools and then technology into the program to make it work. And then in the meanwhile, to do some research for basic uh, biology, but this is a very interesting, as I yeah. mentioned before, very interesting question. And then hopefully we can, yeah. um, we can, we can work into yeah, that. Yeah, I'd mean, love to see if some of your uh, gene uh, or low, low cost, low side, I mean, related to uh, flavor or aroma, aroma, I mean, that actually underlie the alumina resistance or I'm very interested after discussing with you as well. <laughs> we will see what we can do in that in that area. Okay, so I think uh, we are running out of time. So finally, we uh, thank Patricia for giving us such a wonderful uh, segment. Thank, thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.